Great. I'm loving the Jaylene's got um rewild for resilience. That is a great slogan. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, okay, so just in the interest of time, uh, I think we should begin. Uh, please welcome uh, KD Liang. Thank you so much for joining us today, KD. Uh, KD is a prominent leader in sustainability and technology, known for her work in reshaping the global food systems. Uh, she recently served as the APAC Regional Director of Sustainability at the Compass Group, uh, which is the largest food service company with around 5.5 billion meals served annually across 45 countries. Uh, she focuses on creating responsible food supply chains, promoting a circular economy, and supporting communities in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, she's also driving a food pay, uh, waste reduction program, uh, which is is expected to save over 20 million uh, meals per year. Uh, before joining the Compass Group, she established the sustainability practice at McKinsey and Company Australia. Um, she also launched McKinsey Australia's pro bono consulting uh, for climate tech startups, focusing on uh, innovations in food and agriculture. Um, before I hand it over to Katie, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box below and she will get to them post the presentation. Uh, so again, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Katie, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Himange, for the introduction. Um, I am really excited to chat to you guys and I hope to make this a very interactive session where I'm sure I'll be learning a lot from you guys as well. So I'm going to talk, spend some time talking about my own career in sustainability, how I got started, why I'm working on it, and some of the challenges and opportunities involved. And then, and then, well, I'm actually in, in the process of looking for my next climate job as well. So um, I think that's the same for uh, as a lot of you guys. So I'm going to share a bit of experience in this process as well and, and see what we can learn from each other. So why don't I get started? Let me share my screen. My screen background because we are in sustainability. Okay, so um, just can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm actually in China right now, as um, I told some of you earlier, and my hometown is called Li Yue. Uh, is in the Guangdong province in China. Uh, it's uh, like down in the south. So I, I moved to Australia from China when I was 11. So I, I spent um, a lot of my childhood in this village, uh, which looks very much like what's there on the left um, when I was smaller, without the power lines maybe. So it was mainly agricultural, um, bit of you know, like low, low rise buildings here and there. Um, so I grew up in the 90s in China. And if any of you know about like that part of history, it was a time of very rapid economic development. So during my time, it, so much change, during my childhood, there was so much change happening. So we actually used to live in a mud house. And now like the house that I'm in, which is my uh, village home that my grandparents are staying in, is, is now a four-story brick house. Um, and the roads got wider. There were more schools, shops, uh, restaurants, Basically, the village looks like what's there on the right-hand side. You can still see that there are patches of fields here and there, but it's mostly kind of medium-rise apartments. And in the far, far um, end there, there is actually a electric motor factory that has tens of thousands of people. Um, so that... So, so what what does that kind of change mean? So when I was smaller, that was you know, the, the pre-smartphone era. Um, how did I spend my childhood? I, I I went to the rivers and I caught fish, I caught shrimps, I rode around in bikes and then I like, got along these wide roads. But as I was growing up, kind of like near the end of my my primary school era, these were the things that I could no longer do because. For example, like there was a lot of factories being built, so there was a lot of pollution, which meant that the rivers we can't can no longer swim in, and um, it was so polluted that we cannot find any fish in the river. Um, my my grandma's 
right time just came out. It was super loud. Anyways, um, <laughs> um, and then there was this beautiful like five kilometer row of fir trees just outside of our house, and just to widen the row, it got chopped down and it's gone. So, and and then there was just so many things that were happening. Um, and even though I was only in grade five, I knew something was wrong. Even though our lives economically and socially were better. It was at the damage to our environment. And it was at a rate that I didn't know the word back then, but later I just learned that it was basically the definition of unsustainable. It meant that we were depleting our natural resources at a rate higher than we can replenish it. So that basically that whole experience planted a seed in my head that that was something that I wanted to work on. That whatever I work on later on in my life, I want it to, to, it to be at the balance of economy, socially, and and the environment. It couldn't be just one of them. And so, um, I mean, like, I'm not the only person to realize this. So, um, <laughs> for example, the Chinese government is also working a lot on sustainability. And, like... Basically, um, they, they have this double carbon goal right now, which is similar to, you know, the, the carbon neutral goal of a lot of countries. They're basically trying to peak carbon in 2030 and also um, make, be carbon neutral in 2060. I mean, this is a goal that is later than all of the other more developed countries, but um, they're actually doing quite a lot on it, especially in terms of things like air pollution and water pollution, which were the problems that I talked about in my childhood. And if I look out at the sky right now, like it is actually quite blue, which is like much better than what I had during my my later childhood. Um, so things are actually being progressed. And like, I'm sure all of you are in this session because you want to be, or, or you are already in a career in climate and you want to be part of that change. And so it is both a very challenging career, but it's also one that is quite, for and you're working towards something that you believe in so that's part of the kind of journey that I want to share with you guys about and also um yeah it's it's not easy but it is the right thing to do so to talk a little bit about my personal career in climate as I said um the the seed of sustainability has always been planted in my head but as you guys might have known or, or seen um, there, there weren't really that many climate careers until the past three to four years, unless you were in Europe, which um, is maybe five to 10 years ahead of, I say, Australia and the US. And I say that the Australia and the US is maybe another five years ahead of most countries in Asia, including in China here. So in 2012, that's when I started uni, I did an arts and law double degree. Um, so there, there weren't really like uh, the, I say there weren't really kind of climate focused degrees, but within that degree, I made sure I focused on things like environmental law, renewable energy policy, energy law, those kind of areas, which actually later on set me up for success for um working on renewable energy projects. So that that's where I got my start. But as soon as I graduated, <laughs> there were no jobs in climate, and during during my university years, I realized that I didn't want to become a lawyer and I stumbled into the startup world. And the startup, while I call it clean tech startup, it wasn't primarily focused on the clean tech element. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a label that was imposed on it <laughs> because back then people also didn't care too much about it. And so I had a really interesting journey there where I started as an intern, but I later on became a co-founder um, because I was contributing a lot to, to the startup. Um, and like, I think retrospectively, when I tell <laughs> recruiters about this experience, I, you know, I emphasize the, the clean tech element of it because we were building a technology that was helping um, drivers save fuel for their car. But it was also just one of the angles. It, was, it also had a money saving angle. We had an AI angle. It had a IoT angle, et cetera. So uh, while, while you look at this kind of career and it looks like a straight line, it was actually more like a da -da 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 across the climate. Um, and then after that, it, you know, like that startup had some success, but, um, and I tried to do my own startup in green buildings. 
particularly in the green vertical walls that you see, especially in like the, the Singaporean buildings, etc. Um, it didn't take off, <laughs> but it was a good experience. Um, and that was when I realized that, okay, if I wanted to further my my ambitions and sustainability uh, and, and make something out of it, I probably need to build more industry experience, uh, have more exposure and build a stronger network. Um, I thought consulting might be a really good platform to do so. So I joined McKinsey um, in 2018. Again, when I joined McKinsey in Australia, there was nothing, there, there was no formal practice in sustainability. There were the um, renewable energy projects here and there, for example, working on like the Tesla battery uh, in South Australia. Um, and there, are, there are a few other things, uh, for example, doing like due diligence on renewable energy projects, but it wasn't really a thing. So, but like <laughs> you, you might you might find out very soon in, in in this kind of career and especially in climate where things are changing so rapidly, timing is super important. So I'm gonna skip ahead to the next slide. Um so in McKinsey, the Australian office, we are up on the 35th floor. We are overlooking the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. Amazing views. This is what it looks like typically. Um, but in 2019, this was the view when we looked outside the exact same windows. Can any of you guess what happened there and why is the view like that? The bushfires? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, all of you got the right answers. So. Yeah, a lot of you might have remembered that. Um, while it was a national disaster, absolutely tragic, it actually had a, a very little silver lining in terms of it providing um, the literally the burning platform for a lot of the larger companies in Australia to act on climate. So at that time, I was actually working at McKinsey. I, I lobbied with the... The local invest, uh, the lo local stakeholder, uh, the shareholders group, to say that hey, we should invest in a internal research project just to understand the climate risks of Australia's three key sectors. So that's agriculture, power, and mining. And that was the time when, like, this was the view outside. And as soon as we completed that initial risk assessment, we took them to the largest companies like BHP, which is for mining. We took them to the Ausgrid. Um, the, the the AGLs um, and then the um, things like um, Grain Corp, basically some of the largest companies in Australia. And they understood it immediately yeah. in the way that they hadn't understood before because they could see this view outside. They understood that even though some of the leaders still did not believe that climate, climate change was caused by humans, they understood that it was a yeah. risk that needed to be managed. It was a tangible risk that had tangible probabilities and tangible impacts on their own companies. And as a responsible leader, that was something that they needed to, to respond to. And so that was actually, back to my career, that was actually what gave us the impetus to start building the sustainability practice at McKinsey because there was now demand from clients. They were asking us, hey, come build a climate strategy for us. And that was all around the time just before COP26, which was um, the very important COP <laughs> uh, of like, yeah, the, the one in Glasgow. And so timing all aligned and basically um, once we set this up, this sustainability practice up, I think at its peak, it accounted for around 30% of the projects of all of McKinsey Australia, which uh, is just absolutely phenomenal from, from zero to, to that. Um, and that also just um, was the, the push for me personally to be able to work on climate full time and also establish myself as a bit of an expert in the area. Um, and I say expert in quotation marks because it's all relative. Like com I feel like compared to those in Europe who have been working on this for 10, 15 years, um, I'm still technically <laughs> like a long way off. But then in the environment in Australia where this is just getting started, I definitely be one of the people who have a better grasp on this field. So like I think that's something for you guys to, to think about is um like how you can also position yourself to be a front runner in this emerging field um so McKinsey amazing um 
but the, the lifestyle itself is not sustainable. <laughs> Talking about working on sustainability. So I ended up do, doing a secondment to McKinsey.org, which is um, the McKinsey founded NGO working on plastics recycling in Indonesia. Um, that was also amazing. And it just gave me a much deeper knowledge of um, the mm -hmm. circular economy. Um, and, and then like after that, um, like at the same time, I was doing a bunch of pro bono work um, for like pro bono consulting for climate tech startups in Australia. And a lot of them ended up being food tech and ag tech related startups. And that's what got me interested in the food and ag sustainability space in particular. And so that was the kind of like climate jobs that I was looking for. It was either in climate tech VC focusing on food tech and ag, ag tech or it was either in a food and ag related company working on their sustainability, or it was a um, food tech or ag tech startup. And I actually ended up having um, job opportunities in all three of these. Um, however, I ended up choosing the one at Compass Group because uh, it was a it was the largest um, platform for me in terms of impact um, because it's yeah the largest food service company in the world, and I had a chance to build their sustainability strategy and also implemented in the Asia Pacific range, um, which is just like phenomenal for, for someone that I was, like, I'm still fairly young. So um, I basically jumped at it. It was a leap of faith for both my boss and myself, but um, I ended up uh, excelling at the role and um, it, it was basically a dream job. But <laughs> um, like things, yeah, things didn't last forever and there was a change of leadership and um, basically there was a massive restructure at the company and I decided to leave. And so now I am also, again, looking for my next climate job opportunity. And I'm actually in China because I wanted to look inside China, um, just because China has a massive, massive market and is maybe a few years behind um, a lot of the other more developed markets which meant that there might be a bigger chance for me to, to have an impact here based on the kind of information difference that I gained. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, and like, I'm, I, I can come back to any point in my climate career and I'm sure like some of you guys might encounter some of the, the junctures that I've encountered before uh, at some point. So I like, definitely uh, can, can tease out some of the details there. Um, so, while I'm in this process of looking at different ranges of climate jobs, I basically made a summary for you guys, which hopefully can be helpful. So this is by no means meant to be exhaustive, but here are the types of jobs that I'm seeing. So I think a lot of us think about sustainability, like the first thing might be corporate sustainability, which is very much emerging, particularly in the last three to four years. Um, what corporates are currently staffing or hiring, basically they, they want a, especially the larger corporates, they want a sustainability team. I think by now, most of them have a head of sustainability already. And now they're looking more at like the, at the project level, project managers, and analysts um, and in sustainability sometimes corporates don't have a dedicated sustainability function and they align it with corporate affairs regulatory affairs um, that's kind of one type of alignment and then there's another type which is more marketing or comms and then there's another type which is more strategy and occasionally you see it aligned with like legal finance or even operations but those are more rare um and then you have more specialized roles within corporate. So I, I see a lot of roles for um, sustainable procurement and sustainable supply chain, especially, and also sustainable operation. So for example, like if you are a manufacturer or a factory, like I see roles they're hiring for like, how do you actually decarbonize this whole, whole process? Or for example, in the context of Compass, it was more like, how do you, let's say, um, reduce food waste? So, so that's like the more specialized areas. And then a third type is corporate sustainable ventures. So what I'm talking about is when corporates decide that they want to expand like a new arm or like a, establish a new company that is completely focused on um, the, the carbon economy. 
Uh, for example, <laughs> let's say Fortescue Metals Group, mining company, right? <laughs> um, they just want to go green, so they established FFI, which is focusing on green hydrogen. Um, and then you have things like Maersk, which is the, the shipping company. They recently established, an, an, again, a new venture, which is focused on green shipping. Um, and you see a lot of banks are uh, doing that as well. And, and lastly, um, to be part of corporate sustainability, it might be also not a full-time thing. It might just be project participation. For example, if you are part of finance, legal procurement, you're very much likely to be involved in, for example, writing the ES3 report or just being part of the carbon baselining exercise, et cetera, for your company. So corporate sustainability, definitely emerging kind of um, job market there. And then obviously sustainability related or climate tech startups. So it's, it just means that any business that focused on these fields uh, in, in Australia, some of the, the more like famous examples are like 5B for solar power installation. I've got some cable, which is pulling the cable from Darwin to Singapore. Um, we got Val, which is the cultured meat. Gotera, which is um, circular economy, basically using black soldier fights to, um, to digest food waste. Um, Part Zero, which is a carbon kind of management software. So you've got a whole uh, range of things here. And these are you know, just some examples. In these startups, basically any job would be considered a climate job. So you've got a lot of options there. NGOs, similarly, like any NGO with a sustainability spin, um, like WWF, um, I know World Economic Forum, they have a lot of different topics, but definitely a, a big topic on climate. Um, Delterra, which is basically the new name of McKinsey.org, which is the one that I worked for. And then um, I'm also seeing a lot of government jobs. Um, there are um, entire agencies dedicated to you know, climate and sustainability, like Environment Protection Agency. But you've also just got a lot of newer jobs um, coming up, for example, under like the Department of Climate, et cetera, um, or, or even not just like state on federal jobs, but there are like council jobs. So, so there are more policy orientated ones, and then there are the more kind of operational ones. And then you've got your consulting companies. So what I'm seeing is that the MBBs typically are still more focused on the strategy aspect um, at a higher level. So for example, um, referencing my kind of experience at McKinsey, it was much more thinking about, hey, high level, how do, how do you make sure that this company stays winning during the climate transition? So it's thinking about like, how do you embed climate risk into their strategy? How do you restructure their investment portfolio or their product portfolio? Um, like for example, helping a mining company transition into a renewable energy company. Um, so, so those are the, the things that they typically deal with. In terms of the big four, is a little bit um, at the next level. Um, they still do a little bit of strategy, but um, it's a bit more, I think, like, like practical or not, uh, or like, it's um, um, or, or practical or tactical. Like the the things, the things like just basically coming up with your ESG strategy, coming up with your um, net zero pathway. Um, doing carbon baselining, doing verification, things like that are typically more aligned to the existing kind of businesses of big four. And then you've got your specialized carbon consulting companies like your South Pole and your Pollinations, um, which they do a range of what I just mentioned above um, between strategy and also the more uh, tactical stuff, um, depending on the company. And then lastly, um, the last two, in investing so there are three types of well not not three types but like just generally um there's the government type of investing funds so you've got your things like um arena the australian renewable energy agency uh, which is focused on <laughs> in investing in renewable energy projects and you've got the cfc clean energy finance corporation which is again very similar so those are the government ordained um investment vehicles into the green economy. And they've got your private funds, which are the, the VCs and your PE funds. There are a lot of VC funds emerging that are purely focused on the climate transition. So for example, main sequence, which spun out of CSRO, um, you've got your Viresen, which spun out of the CFC. Um, and then you've got a couple of 
other ones like Wollamai, which spun out of um, Macquarie Bank, etc. And then you've got a lot of just standard funds that are now setting up green investing branches, or they are hiring people who are looking after their sustainability to, to just drive their investment policy. And then lastly, like I call it sustainable fields, which just means that if you're working in these fields like sustainable, uh, like renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, second economy, et cetera, like you're basically already in a climate job. So again, like <laughs> no, no, there's no no need to like further classify. So so this is the the kind of range that I've seen in the job market. Happy for you guys to you know um like add more that you've seen. But um let me scroll. So what I'm seeing in terms of like where the market is going and how they are hiring is that um let's start from the the, the left. Which is basically what what are um, what what are employers looking for when they are hiring for people to work in sustainability? Uh, this is in the context that sustainability and, and climate jobs are a relatively new thing, uh, especially um, I, I'm I'm talking primarily in Australia, but also I think this applies to the US to a certain degree as well. Um, like people. People want to want pe people obviously want people who are experienced in this, but that's um, that's very unlikely to come by just because of how new this whole area is. And so I'd say that, and also based on my personal experience of hiring for jobs, um, the first top uh, the top attribute is demonstrated will to work in this area. Um, it's different from just pure will <laughs> it needs to be demonstrated and what I mean by that is that you need to have shown that you've put some stakes into wanting to work in this for example either by um, demonstrating that you've already worked on some projects on this or um, you are doing a course on this uh, in your studies for example in your MBA studies or you are doing let's say like an online short course for this and so basically this demonstrated will um like it's very much tied to the second and third attributes uh, so I might as well talk to, about them in the same go but for example um like when I was setting up the the sustainability team at Compass um I was basically asked to assign a head of sustainability in each of the eight markets in APAC that I was um, leading. Um, and those are the things I looked for. Um, for example, the the head of sustainability for Australia that I ended up appointing, um, he never worked in sustainability before, but he was doing a part-time MBA and was doing his thesis on sustainability and climate. And so he was very much actively learning about it uh, and he's very curious about all of these topics. Um, he's got a lot of actual operational experience um, in the company, which meant that if he knew what was his strategy, he was able just to execute it um, to very effectively. Um, and so he basically took the first box and the third box um, and the kind of experience like, um, uh, obviously, it's ideal to have already done some sustainable before, but <laughs> that's I I think I think that's also unrealistic. So he 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 came in with that with those, and he basically gained those experiences very quickly. And now, like he's also considered a thought leader in his space in Australia. Um, and so uh, what I'm saying here is that you can build the experience and the knowledge quite quickly as soon as you step into the door of sustainability jobs. And so that relates to the top right box of how do you actually get in? Um, I say the, the easiest way to get in is firstly through project participation if you aren't already in these jobs. Um, this is most this is most applied to the kind of corporate sustainability route. It's, for example, you're in the company's um, let's say legal, operational, or whatever whatever team, if there are projects that you can be a part of that is sustainability related, for example, writing the report, doing carbon baselining, 
writing out a climate risk response for the company or for your particular part of the business, this is usually the way for a lot of people to start transitioning to a more full-time kind of role in sustainability um, if you are able to get these kinds of experiences. Um, the second one that is also very likely um, to get you in is studying a short course. Um, one of the most popular ones I've seen is the one from Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. Um, it's super popular in the kind of like mid-senior managers to even company leaders who wanted to demonstrate that, hey, I'm serious about learning about sustainability. Um, and even though they might not actually work full-time sustainability jobs, they want to signal to the outside world that um, they are learned about it and they can make the right decisions in these areas. And so if you actually look at the LinkedIn profiles of a lot of company leaders, look, um, they have a lot of them have done this course in the past you know, three, four years. Um, so, so that is another way to, to get your foot in the door. Um, and then I, I think like once you've got one of these or ideally both of these, it's very much likely that you'll be able to, you know, get in. And basically the more you do, the more experiences you accrue, the more likely that you will be able to get the next opportunity. And if I talk about like what the market is like, <laughs> as you can see, it's all going up because there's just a massive increase of demand overall. Like firstly, when we think about corporate sustainability, because all these corporates who like if they want to, if they want anyone to take themselves seriously, they basically have a net zero uh, goal, and to to make a net zero goal work, they basically need to have a sustainability team. And so, um, I say that maybe in kind of like 2020, 2021 kind of like timeline, a lot of the companies were hiring for the kind of like head of sustainability roles. Um, but as these roles have pr pretty much been filled and like they would kind of taken time to mature and like build out a team, I think I say like most of the jobs now are more kind of like the, the mid to the mid to mid senior roles, like the, the senior managers, managers focusing on particular projects to get to net zero. And also maybe even some analysts like focusing on very specialized areas like um, nature and biodiversity or um, let's say carbon markets, offsets, etc. cetera. Um, next, you've got your consulting, which basically when the corporates are increasing their demands in, in sustainability capability, that's why consulting capability also has to go up. Um, and then obviously you've got your like the climate tech space is all just just ever growing. It's you've got the startups themselves, you've got a VC, um, and you've got like all kinds of areas of investing that support it. Um, and in, and yeah, like I when when I say that um, you can like like you should focus on all of the project experiences to get in. It's also because that as this field starts to mature, like the the reliance on experience, former experience becomes more and more important. I say that like three, four years ago, a lot of the sustainability leadership roles that people were hiring or getting into, they haven't actually worked on sustainability at all. Like they have a lot of internal corporate experience uh, in the field that is somewhat aligned to sustainability. And voila, like one day they just got like put on this hat of sustainability. But I think that's no longer the case, especially as more and more people have now gotten that last few years of experience. And so there's now a stronger um, demand for it. Um, even even in the kind of mid, like two senior roles. Um, so I think like if you want to, if you haven't gotten into this field yet and you want to get in, like don't wait too long. That's my uh, message. Um, it's not a, an easy career to be in. Um, there are challenges both in the job market, but also on the job. Um, I think the, the latter is actually bigger, but let's talk about the job market challenges first. So currently 
what I'm really, really, really frustrated about as I'm looking at jobs is that a lot of the roles that they're hiring for, especially in the corporate sustainability space, they focus a lot on the regulatory compliance and reporting aspects. It's basically the more like, hey, like, let's tick the box that I've got someone running sustainably my organization type of roles. They're just there to, to fulfill all of the legal and like market expectation requirements rather than the company thinking that, hey, like I truly believe that sustainability is the right thing to do for the company and something so strategic for me to stay alive in the next few decades. Like if the, you, you can you can actually see where a company is thinking about in terms of sustainability by where they're putting their roles. So I've actually rejected quite a few offers um, because I believe that they weren't positioning sustainability in the right way within the company. And that showed me like where their head is at in terms of their, their kind of um, understanding of the importance of this function. A, a related frustration is that um, you, you see a lot of times that sustainability is not being placed at very senior positions. Um, if, you, if you're seeing that the, the highest leader of sustainability in a company, especially a large one, is at a senior manager level, like I, I'd have serious doubts about how serious this company is in driving this effort. Um, I'm not saying that, hey, like, we're, we're super important like we we, we it's, it's not for ego to have this role in a high position but it's sustainability is one of those areas that it's very challenging to get um prioritized on a day-to-day -day level and so unless you're actually um at the seat of the table of making serious decisions basically as an exec it's very hard to get sustainability on the agenda so that's super important as well and lastly, I'm seeing a lot of, like, especially the, the, the less mature companies have very unrealistic expectations uh, on, basically on the JD. Um, for example, they require people to have way too many years of sustainability job experience. For example, like they're like, hey, we want you to have like 15 years of sustainability experience. I'm like, excuse me, that field did not exist 15 years ago. Um, and... They have some, some, sometimes they have too much emphasis on academic background. Like you have to have had um, studied in environmental management or like environmental engineering, um, which I think is true for certain roles that are more technical, especially if you are basically leading like a carbon based lining exercise or if you're running something um, you're quite deep in the carbon market or if you're doing something quite deep in the renewable energy space. But a lot of times, carbon knowledge is not really knowledge. It requires some knowledge, but it's more like a, a mindset, is a way of doing things, is a, is a, is a lens <laughs> that you impose on the existing field that you already know. And so, like it, this this job market also requires a lot of like reverse education <laughs> on the recruiters and the employers. On like, hey, you know what? What you are expecting is probably not what you want. Like here, here is what I think is what you actually need for this job. Um, so there's a lot of things that you, you need to consider <laughs> when you're actually looking at JD's like, mm, does this look right? Um, so once you get the job, it's actually was a very challenging <laughs> because as I said, like it's um, it's not day to day. Uh, it's super high priority. So let's say at Compass, like I, even though. It was one of the three strategic pillars of Compass, like sustainable. It was performance, it was um, people, and then it was sustain like planet. So basically sustainability. But even even then, on a day to day, it's like, hey, let's make sure we are staying profitable. Second, like, I mean, we we're actually first. Like, let's make sure we have no incidents. Like, let's make sure we tick all of the boxes on safety. Safety first, and then like profit. And then like some kind of like operational efficiency, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, oh, hey, we've done everything right. So now let's look at sustainability. But you never get to that stage where you have done everything right. So <laughs> sustainability is always kind of like being pushed down and I always need to push it up. That's 
basically all of the related frustrations I have in this role is that you often feel like you're fighting an uphill battle. You're always educating everyone around you to, you know, like this is something to really, to, to really be serious about because sustainability is something a little bit more long-term. And once you're trying to compete it with the more short-term interests of a company, it's, it, it is extremely difficult. And you always have to shift your narrative to align with the shorter term values. For example, hey, like it's reducing food waste. It's about reducing our food cost. That's how I got it in. <laughs> Rather than like, hey, reducing food waste is actually going to save the planet because a third of our food is lost. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just different narratives. Um, and a lot of times you have very little direct authority and resources because again like it's a relatively new function is much less mature than than other functions like procurement operations uh sales marketing whatever like people are still not understanding the role of sustainability so again like once you come into a company and you're working on this kind of field you you basically need to do a lot of um self advocacy in terms of like hey like I need this many resources for this to work. This is why this is important. Like you're always making business cases. So it's not an easy job. And I joke with a lot of my friends also in this space that like we almost need like this mental health support group <laughs> amongst the professionals. Um, and we always kind of like ping each other like, hey, like I ran into this problem today. Like, and they're like, yup, same. I'm like, okay, that makes me feel better. <laughs> So it's, there's a lot of that, but upside is, I think upside is things that you guys already understand. It's basically the right thing to do. Like, I, I think the the reason why you're here is that you, you actually believe in working on this. Like from a, from a personal and professional development perspective, you are entering into a space that is growing rapidly which means that you will be learning a lot you'll be accessing a lot of the newest best resources and you might actually benefit from this growing industry so for example I definitely benefited from being a first mover in this relatively new space a couple of years ago and be able to advance quite rapidly um, like from a career perspective in, in respect to my age so that's something it's more on like the selfish or personal side of benefits. But um, I think, yeah, most important of all, it just means that working on this, it, you, you are driven by your purpose and you're driven by your values every day. And no matter how difficult the day-to-day -day is, that's what gets me going and keeps me awake every day. And to you know, get back to the grind and also, <laughs> and yeah. And uh, I, I have to truly believe that I'm doing something that is right for myself, for my family and friends, for my community and for the planet. So that's why I've decided to you know, stick it out and, and work on this kind of career. And I'm sure that's why you guys are here too. So that basically concludes the bulk of my presentation. And I'm very keen to actually talk to you guys about the, the, the Q&A. Um, <laughs> Haman, do you want to lead some of the facilitation here? Yes, sure. Um, so just now we'll uh, move, as Katie highlighted, we'll move into the Q&A. Let's start with Cedric's question from the box. Uh, this actually, even I wanted to know more about your challenges with your own green building startup. So Cedric wants to know what was your biggest learning from that experience? Um, <laughs> yeah. I think um it's I think it's the power of having the right network and sponsors in basically setting up a successful startup. I don't think this my answer to this is very specific to sustainability careers in general, but just for startups in general, especially young founders. Like I basically thought that I could run all of this myself. I didn't actually ask for that much help. Um, I didn't have a, a bunch of friends around me who I was bouncing ideas with. I was working on this quite alone. And I think like that's never a good way to go when you're trying to build out a full 
company from just like a figment of your imagination. And so I think, yeah, the the le learning that you actually need a support network um, and people who believe in your vision, people who can actually help you advance this is the most important. I mean, that's great. Like, so I personally work with the philanthropy that supports mm -hmm. early stage climate startups. And that's the number one ad I advice I also give to any startup that get your co-founding team or your internal team built out that or your network adv of advisors built out that you have someone to bounce ideas on or when you get bogged down by the challenges, there's someone else to pick up the slack. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, let me open up the floor. If anyone has any questions, y'all can just raise your hand and and uh, ask Katie. Um, if not, Katie, I would love to. I mean, you mentioned something when you were uh, choosing between the job opportunities, and you went with Compass because uh, you highlighted that that was the largest platform for impact. Uh, would love to know in that when you were in that stage, what other criteria did you use to select? Uh, the kind of job or the kind of role you wanted to get into? Yeah, I... Actually, there, there were not many, that many other um, criteria because I knew I'd be learning a lot in all of the opportunities that I mentioned. And so impact was my most important criteria. And it's actually... I use my friend's example so at the same time like one of my best friends was also um looking for a job and he was he was much more senior than me at McKinsey he was an associate partner um and basically he, he quantified his job hunting criteria to such an extreme that basically it's like the next job that I'm going to look for is the one where I can pull down the most carbon from the atmosphere that was it and so the job that he ended up choosing was um, to lead strategy at ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, which basically he got to oversee uh, the where the government is putting his money into <laughs> renewable energy. So I, I say he basically picked the, the right choice. Um, I think I was less extreme <laughs> or quantified in terms of the decision-making process, but that was something that applied in my logic because I knew that from a numbers perspective, Compass was a massive platform. Mm -hmm. And when I, like, for example, I, I knew that if even if I halved food waste in Asia Pacific, that's why I could save 20 million meals a year just from this single lever. Um, and that's something that mm -hmm. I'd not be able to achieve at a smaller company, which were the other ones, the, the other options I was looking at. So yeah, that, that influenced my decision making. I, I didn't, I wouldn't say this is just the only right way to to look for a job. I think we're all at different stages in our career and it's okay to also prioritize personal learning or like income or like um like any any other criteria relevant to you. For example, for me right now, it's a little bit different. Like I want to prioritize jobs in the Asia market for my personal learning of this new geography, but impact also plays a massive role. Um, and it's also why I decided to focus on Asia. So yeah. it's, I think it's a very personal process, but I'm like happy to brainstorm or like um, compare notes with you guys in terms of how you guys are thinking about job decisions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Caesar. you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, would you like a question? Yes, thank you, boss. Thank you, Pat. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I have been trying to to get my food climate in a climate job, but it's still not successful. And um, but but my question go more. I also my background is finance, so companies sometimes are hiring these sustainability jobs. Just because they have to click the tick. But also, if we want to go get our food in a first shop, maybe we will accept the shops. And and maybe at the beginning is keep this balance, get the company happy and do as much as we can do. So 
in your experience when you was working, I suppose maybe you faced the situation a couple of times, what things did you do in your job that you feel was impactful, but at the end keep the company happy? Your boss happy and the revenue of the thing. So let me try to clarify. Is, is the question an example of things I did that was good, but didn't make my boss happy? No, like you did impactful things in terms of sustainability, but the other, in the other hand, also keep your company happy with the revenue uh, goals. And because I feel some people, some companies are hiring sustainability just because they have to. Yeah, yeah. So you so, have to try to do yeah. the best that you can do in that position because it's nobody else, but also don't lose your job. So be aligned mm -hmm. with the goal of that company as bad as could be, but it's the only that maybe we have. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the challenge and also the exciting thing about um, this these type of jobs is to find that alignment of business value as well as sustainability value. And the 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 um example that I kept mentioning when I was at Compass, and and the reason why I chose it as the kind of um uh, like signature <laughs> like sustainability program is like the food waste reduction. The the reason why I was able to get it over the line so quickly was because I used the business case like if we reduce this much food waste, it meant that we need to buy. It. X amount less food, which meant saving X dollars. Like from a commercial perspective, it just made so much sense. I know that not like this is actually one of the minority of cases where um, sustainability value aligns with short term commercial value. Usually they align with the more long term values. But like by put by doing that first, I could use the money saved to then invest in other things that will take longer time to um to to manifest the value for example uh, in terms of like greening up the supply chain or working on like fair wages etc etc um so i think a lot of the cases currently where um you can get short-term effic efficiency in by terms of, by doing sustainability is in terms of like um, reducing energy, reducing, uh, increasing efficiency in processes, like reducing waste, et cetera. Um, so those are kind of like the basics to get right. And then you work on other things. Like sometimes it, it also doesn't need to take that long for companies to see value. Like um, it's a matter of like risk appetite as well. So another really, really famous and successful example of a company transitioning well um, in this climate economy is Ostead in Norway. So they were originally one of the largest coal power like, producers in the world. And back in like the early 2000s, they, they realized that, hey, you know, like the carbon market is coming. They're going to have a carbon tax. Um, it's going to be much more effective yeah. and like the right thing to do for them to switch to becoming a renewable power um, company and so they basically divested all of their coal resources and invested in offshore wind and now they're the largest offshore wind producer in the world um, and also very 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 profitable um, so it, it sometimes <laughs> does align in, in the short medium term oh Danish yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you, SJ. Um, I also saw some other interesting questions. So, um, what's your view on green jobs in emerging markets? Um, I mean, I'm in China right now, so I can talk a little bit about that. It is, it's tough. It's not meant. It's not that many green jobs. <laughs> it I think depends on the, especially in a place like China, it depends on the, the nation's policy. Like if there are specific verticals that they are interested in, that's where you can find the jobs. For example, in, in China, that would be um, EVs and batteries and, and basically anything renewable energy related. Um, it's Outside of that, it's very, very hard to find green jobs 
Um, there are also the largest companies like your Tencent, your um, like ByteDance, like your TikTok, right? Like, you know, or your Alibaba's. They they are also the ones that will hire heads of sustainability to bring up the um, the data centers or like the supply chain, etc. But outside of that you know, top tier company, I think most companies haven't woken up to the, the demand <laughs> for this, um, especially with the economy situation right now. Like I think it's, it's a little, little bit of regression like in other places in the world. So a lot of companies, especially medium sized and smaller companies, they are on the edge of survival. So that's the first thing they're focusing on is, hey, we, we don't just ride out the way. And I, I, I'm thinking that 2025 to 2026 is probably the timing when there will be a massive increase of sustainability jobs. But if you want to be a first mover, it's probably now is a better time to move. Um, another kind of question, it's not really a really question, but um, I'm, I'm seeing SJ talking about the link between wealth inequality and climate change and not wanting to make a small number of people more wealthy. Um, can you actually elaborate on that? It's a really interesting kind of perspective. Yeah, I guess um, the difficulty for me is that I'm thinking sort of further in terms of when you've got businesses that are doing green jobs, but they're really just doing it so that they can make more money. And I kind of personally think that uh, our economic system and the externality of uh, of the harms for future generations is like a key part of the problem and I just don't want to have a bar of it. <laughs> so it makes it, it, it really limits it to kind of like NGOs, maybe some local councils, like it just limits the um, types of organisations that I feel I can work for, even though I realise that the bigger like immediate impact does come through these large corporations just because they have such wide scope. I just personally don't want to have anything to do with them. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting viewpoint and something that I've definitely had a lot of internal debate with because especially um, as part of McKinsey, like you get exposed to a lot of the the largest polluters in the world, like all the mining companies and the, the oil and gas companies. Um, and part of the debate is like, whether I should work for them to help them be better because like you 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 fix the the problem at its source or at, at its root or um you stay away from it because like you believe that no matter how much you work on like you just end up you know benefiting um the the, the few people who who <laughs> get richer and 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 maybe like it won't even make a difference. And I think it really depends on the company for me personally, uh, having struggled with this problem a lot myself in the past few years. Um, like I've had the chance to speak to many different kind of company leaders. And I think I could, I can now tell whether a company leadership is honestly wanting to be part of that transition. Um, and and in that case, I, I think I'd be willing to work for them even though it's in like a still a very capitalistic kind of framework, but I know that I'll be able to deliver a lot of massive impact um, versus companies that just want it to be part of the transition just so that they can keep making more money. And sometimes the line is a little bit blurred, um, but um, I think, yeah, for me it's a case by case kind of decision. And like, like, I think I think all types of roles and levers are required. Like you need your NGOs, and you need your um. I I love my climate activists and protesters because they make make it easier for corporates to work on sustainability because it, it makes the need more pressing. And then you also need the people in corporates to to make them greener because corporates are still the kind of largest impact vehicle of the capital market right now um so yeah it's um I, I think everyone is needed to make this solution work uh thank you katie uh, i think we're a little over time but there's one more question in the q a box katie if you could like to take that if you don't mind staying back a couple of more minutes yeah no I, i'm i'm good um 
So there's, are there any other philanthropy or social ventures like companies that are operating at scale? Are they effective and why do they fail? Okay. Um, Compass is not a philanthropy. Compass is a very, <laughs> very much a corporate. But um, honestly, I I think that that's part of my problem when I look at philanthropy or NGO jobs is having been in one, it, it is also frustratingly slow. And you sometimes I just feel like no matter how much I'm working on it, it's it's like but it's usually at a smaller scale, um, and you end up spending a lot of time just doing fundraising. <laughs> um, I think there there are some, there will be someone out there that will be doing things very effectively. Um, I actually think typically the ones under the effective altruism umbrella are quite good, but um, I'm not sure which one of those. Uh, have a very climate edge so I think yeah happy to open up to the floor to answer this question um I, I don't actually have a good answer for you because that also seems like a company that I'll be looking for but have so far failed to find and I mean lastly any thoughts on climate careers in India no, no idea. <laughs> but I know India has a booming plastic recycling and just in general recycling space and, and a circular economy. Um, that could be one area to look into. Um, because when I was working on McKinsey.org, a lot of the climate, the, the, a lot of the recycling solutions that we were exploring actually came out of India. Uh, and we, we ended up partnering with an Indian company to deliver the recycling software that we were using in um, Indonesia and Argentina. So that could be a start. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Katie. I, I, I hope I haven't missed anyone's questions. Uh, we've just put a small uh, event feedback poll. Uh, please do answer those questions. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Katie. I hope uh, the participants can reach out to you offline if they would like to speak further on any of the points discussed today. Great. Um, super happy speaking to you guys and um, hopefully we'll meet again in some other context and good luck with your plant career. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone.